Number 4. Vertebrate Embryos Why do textbooks use drawings of similarities in vertebrate embryos as evidence for their common ancestry, even though biologists have known for over a century that vertebrate embryos are not most similar in their early stages and the drawings are faked? Okay, this one actually has a shadow of credibility. The drawings in question are done by Ernest Haeckel. Uh, he was a German man and he studied embryos of various vertebrates and made these drawings based on his research. On the extreme left is a fish and on the right is a human embryo. And I, it's ironic but I actually got this picture off of a biblical support website that compared Ernest Haeckel to Nazis and said that Nazis used many of his theories in their doctrines which I feel is just a complete low blow and an ad hominem attack but I won't get too much into it because I'm discussing the hard fact here. That same site conveniently supplied me with this picture. It shows Haeckel's original drawings on the top of the first stages of the embryo's development compared to actual photos of the embryos taken with modern technology. Now, if you look at them, yes, Haeckel's drawings don't look exactly like the, the actual ones. For instance, he, ma he made them appear to be the same size. He neglected the yolk sac on the salamander. You know, small things like that. But in all, in all truth, they don't really look that much different. And you have to remember, Haeckel didn't have the imaging equipment that we have nowadays. He would have had to take these embryos apart and tease them apart and just look at them with his eyes and a, and a handheld microscope. So his drawings aren't perfect, but it's not as if he maliciously faked them. Uh, after all, embryology is still used today to show relationships between um, various uh, living things it's still a legitimate field of evolutionary study. Number 5. Archaeopteryx Why do textbooks portray this fossil as the missing link between dinosaurs and modern birds, even though modern birds are probably not descended from it, and its supposed ancestors do not appear until millions of years after it? Ah, yes. That controversial creature called the Archaeopteryx. A dinosaur with feathers, a bird with teeth and a bony tail. What do you call it? Some like to say that it's fully a bird and therefore not a transitional species. Yada yada yada. It's a very clear transition. However, birds are not directly descended from it in the same way that we are not directly descended from chimpanzees. We share a common ancestor, just as birds share a common ancestor with this thing. You see, evolution is not a strict linear progression. You not go from dinosaur to feathered dinosaur to archaeopteryx to cute fluffy little bird. It just does not happen that way. It's more like this. All of the dinosaurs, the pre-birds, and modern birds share common ancestry at the bottom left corner of that little tree, and then branches come off the tree as time progresses. You get, transi you get forms that look transitional as the tree advances, but all these creatures are actually animals that are perfectly adapted to their ecosystem as it was. As you can see, up in the extreme right end of this, you see the Archaeopteryx diverts from the other birds just before the end, in the same way that chimpanzees diverted from the hominids in our human evolution. Number 6 peppered moths. Why do textbooks use pictures of peppered moths camouflaged on tree trunks as evidence for natural selection when biologists have known since the 1980s that the moths don't normally rest on tree trunks and all the pictures have been staged? Alright, I'm gonna completely call bullshit on this one. It is a fraud. That is a lie. It is completely facetious. 
As you can see, this is a picture of the two color morphs of the peppered moth. On the above is the white variety, and below is the black variety. In nature, as far back as we can remember, the white variety had always been more common. However, around the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, soot from factories started to cover tree trunks, making them darker. Then, the black color morph, which is better camouflaged against those dark tree trunks, became much more prevalent than the white one which had previously dominated the population. This is, this is one of the best references for evolution we have. I mean, it's something that happens within our lifetime and that we can observe in nature. When those trees became white again, again the white moth became prevalent. And yes, they do rest on the tree trunks, and yes, that does make them more or less prone to birds when they do. I do not know where he is getting this do not rest on tree trunks and the photos were staged nonsense because the simple fact is that is a lie. They do rest on the tree trunks and those photos were not staged. That is a lie, pure and simple. Number 7. Darwin's Finches Why do textbooks claim that beak changes in Galapagos finches during a severe drought can explain the origin of species by natural selection, even though the changes were reversed after the drought ended and no net evolution occurred. Okay, so Darwin's finches. They're all descended from the same common ancestor, but they have different shaped and sized beaks depending on the foods that they eat. Now, short-term studies have showed that depending on the availability of food, Sometimes the finch's beaks will change slightly depending on what kind of seed is available for them to eat and a severe drought can, re can reduce them to having to eat harder, f harder seeds so that only larger beaked finches will survive but then when the drought ends they go back to normal. They like some, he's trying to claim that this means that there is no net evolution and it can just bounce around. Well, he fails to take into consideration time scale. You see, the Galapagos Islands have a huge variety of living of ecosystems on them, from high mountains to deserts to coastlines, and there's always different kinds of foods available depending on what island you're on and what part of that island you're on. Now, some of these ecosystems will remain unchanged for millions of years. Some will change in a time span of a decade or two. So, the, the finches that live in the areas of the islands that aren't going to change for several thousand years are of course not going to show much difference in beak size from one generation to the next. However, those that live in much more unstable climate regions would show adaptations the, to fit them. The finches fit their environment. They change depending on how on what food is available to them. If the change is permanent, then if if the change in the environment is permanent, then the change in the finch will also be permanent. It's either adapt or die. And the finches that and the finches that don't adapt die. The boat redundant there.